Kill it with fire! May not be the best response. <laughs> to another episode of For the Love of Bugs. In our last episode, we looked at how the population of crazy ants and the Biosphere 2 projects went absolutely uh, crazy, and how that was really our fault. Now we ended that episode by asking a very important question, a question of why it is that habitats that have a heavy human influence are so prone to invasive species and unstable population dynamics. Now, the obvious answer is that we're just really bad at things. And if you're a misanthropist, that may be the one that you choose to go with. I, on the other hand, uh, think that there's probably actually more to the story. And probably the best way of illustrating this is to take a look at human agricultural systems. You may recall last time that there were four main things that I identified as being characteristics of human disturbed ecosystems. One, that there are low levels of biodiversity. Two, that there are high levels of pests. Three, that there are also very high levels of introduced species. And then four, that there are disruptions to carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen cycles. Now, of these four things, we're going to primarily be concentrated on only two of them for this particular episode. First, the low levels of biodiversity. And then second, the high levels of pests. So let's first start by looking at biodiversity. Now, a number of studies have found that biodiversity actually impacts the frequency of crop pests within a field. And that's not necessarily the full picture. If you're looking at the full picture, it isn't simply sufficient for a species to be present. It is necessary for that species to be common within that biodiversity. And probably the best way of making sense of that is to take a look at the example of a predator and of a pest species. So if you're looking at this, it's not sufficient for the predator just simply to be there. If you have one predator and millions of a crop pest, that one predator isn't really going to make that much of a difference. Indeed, if your numbers of predators are too low, it can take them a while to be able to ramp up to the level of the crop pest. And in that time, that crop pest is probably going to do a lot of damage to your crops. So what you really need is you need higher levels of the predators of these crop pests. And so when you're looking at this, it isn't just necessarily necessary to have high levels of these crop predators, of the predators of these crop pests, you need something to feed those predators when the crop pest isn't present. And so you don't just simply need that crop pest present, you also need all the other things that these predators will eat, especially if you're looking at generalist predators. Beyond that, you're also going to need to look at a variety of different predators. And a really great example of that is to sort of think about the different types of ecological roles that predators can fill. If you have a crop pest that, say, has toxic skin, something that has to eat the whole pest, say you're looking at something like an, a, a caterpillar with toxic skin, Something with chewing mouth parts that has to eat the whole caterpillar is going to be affected by that toxic skin. And so it's not going to be as effective at controlling that pest. But if you're looking at something with piercing mouth parts that is able to pierce through the skin of that caterpillar, that is going over to the things that don't have the, the parts of the caterpillar that don't have toxins in them. 
that is going to be way more effective at controlling that crop pest. So having different types of predators present is going to help provide insurance against different types of pests. So in total, what you need is you need to have a variety of different species present and abundant, but you also need to have a variety of different ecological roles present. Now, one of the things that can really impact that is actually the use of pesticides. So when you apply pesticides to a field, it doesn't affect everything the same way. And one of the things that can happen when you do this is that it can really off balance the numbers of species that are present within a field by affecting some species more than it affects others. But it can also disrupt these linkages and the variety of ecological roles that are present within this ecosystem. So much so that sometimes certain applications of pesticides can actually lead to higher levels of the crop pests rather than lower levels. <music> point, it's important to start talking about one of the major downsides of a pesticide, namely the resistance that populations start to develop to them. Now resistance is something that you see happening all over the place, whether it be the DDT, resistant populations of malaria transmitting mosquitoes in Africa, or whether it be the antibiotic resistant populations of bacteria that are increasingly popping up all over the world. Or sometimes even if you look over at the uh, populations of malaria causing protozoans, they're actually becoming resistant on over to quinines, the first compounds that were used to try to control them. So what is resistance? How does resistance develop? Well, the best way of explaining this is to really boil it down to one of the basic fundamentals of biology which is that genetic variation exists within populations. So within a population, you're going to have individuals that are more sensitive to pesticides and individuals that are less sensitive to pesticides. And when you apply that pesticide, that is going to preferentially target those more sensitive individuals and affect less the less sensitive individuals naturally. And so what happens is, is that a pesticide application is actually a very strong selective pressure that causes the population itself to shift in favor of these less susceptible individuals. And beyond that, this is something that can actually start to perpetuate itself because as the less susceptible as the more susceptible individuals start to decrease in the population, it makes it more likely that these less susceptible individuals are going to find other less susceptible individuals, reproduce, and breed a whole new population of less susceptible individuals. Now at this point, there's two main things that can really speed up this process. One is the frequency with which the pesticide is applied. If you have something that is applied frequently, that makes it more likely that these less susceptible individuals are going to have a harder time at surviving. It is, in fact, tilting the whole deck in favor of these less sensitive individuals. The second thing that can come into effect is the geographic area over which the pesticide is applied. So if you have the pesticide only applied to a very small area, it makes it more likely that individuals from outside that area will migrate on in and dilute the gene pool of resistance that is developing within this population. But as you expand that area out, it makes it less and less likely that these sensitive individuals will be migrating in and increases the probability that resistance is going to be developed more quickly. And so what you end up having is basically a ratcheting effect, 
where as you use a pesticide, what happens is it disrupts the ecology of the crop. As you disrupt the ecology of the crop, this leads to, this is more likely to lead to higher numbers of the pests. As the pest becomes more common, you need to use the pesticide more frequently. As the pesticide is used more frequently, the pest starts to develop more resistance. As the pest itself starts to develop more resistance, it means you need to use more and more of the pesticide in order to achieve the same effect. This only serves to increase the speed at which the pest develops resistance. So it goes on and on like this until the pesticide is no longer useful. So how do we stop this? How do we prevent this from happening? Well, perhaps one of the best ways in order to stop this is to re-examine things and move away from the strategy of kill them all. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, scientists have for decades now encouraged the use of refuges within agricultural systems. What's a refuge? A refuge is simply a section of the crop which is left untreated with pesticides. The idea here is, is that this section of untreated cropland allows the less resistant pests to develop without any issues so that they will then be more likely to breed with more resistant individuals from the treated sections of the crops. As long as resistance is not a dominant trait, the effect of this should be to dilute resistance within the crop uh, species population. Yet, refuges and their use in agriculture are frequently considered to be a theoretical solution rather than a practical one. So to examine this, a study was carried out on the pink bollworm. The pink bollworm is a cotton pest that is found in both the United States and India. And what this study did is it looked at the pink bollworm on these fields that were planted with Bt cotton. Now Bt cotton is one that has been genetically engineered to produce the Bt toxin that is toxic to different types of insects. This particular toxin is toxic to the pink bollworm. And what they were looking for is how resistance to this toxin was developing in both India and the United States. Why these two areas? Well, both of them have rules for the use of refuges and agriculture on the books, but compliance with these rules is a little bit lower in India than it is in the United States. And so this gave a really opportune look as to how effective these refuges are in preventing resistance. And one of the results that they found with this is that resistance to Bt cotton was developing much faster in India than it was in the United States. The refuges were working. And this is an example of short-term gain versus long-term loss. It's really, really easy for us to focus in on addressing the issue that is immediately in front of us and not paying attention to the bigger picture behind it all. We frequently distill things down to simple messages like, I need to use this pesticide in order to save me money by saving my crops. Or to say, conversely, that pesticides are bad because resistance develops in a way that makes them unsustainable. Both of them, while true, only look at a single problem, a single facet of the whole system, and they fail to take into account how the whole system operates. And this is a reoccurring theme that we'll come to again and again. It is very easy for people to see a problem and then work to solve that problem without taking the time to fully examine the system that caused the problem in the first place. Now we touched on this somewhat in the first episode, when I mentioned that science is not just simply 
a simple line of questions and answers, but an interconnected body of knowledge. It came up again in the second episode, as I mentioned how a failure to create a fully functioning ecosystem resulted in an overabundance of crazy ants in the Biosphere 2 project. And this will come up again in the next episode as we start to bring some of these elements together when we take a look over at the water skater beetle, which is in the genus Stennis. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to like and subscribe. Also, please make sure to check out below for links to find us on social media. And until next time, keep your eyes on the little guys. Thank you.